702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. Who is not actually naked. We just had an hour, Chris, of talking about naked protests on the show. <laughs> uh, so this is the perfect segue into the next segment. How are you? Uh, I know I'm in good shape. And you? Are you naked? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do tend to denude myself in the show. To de- denude yourself. Away. You separate yourself from <laughs> nakedness, distance yourself from allegations. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, we had a fascinating question last week. I think it was what in relation to where we hear the direction that sound comes from. I think you've given it some more thought. Yeah, well, I... I answered quite briefly this question that came in last week and I thought about the programme afterwards and I thought, no, that was actually a really subtle and really, really important question. And and I apologise. I think it was Mike who asked it. And sorry if I got your name wrong. I thought it was Mike who asked it. And I thought this deserves an, a return visit because what the, what was said was when a person puts their head on a pillow and they've got one ear pointing upwards, then it's obvious when sounds are coming from above. But when you're just standing up and walking around, how do you know that sounds are coming from above you or below you? Because your ears can resolve left and right. You can tell that something's coming from the right because it it reaches your right ear before your left ear. But how does it do it for up and down? So I thought maybe I'd just dwell on that for a moment because this is rather important because it's not as simple as just resolving between two ears. There is a concept of something called a head shadow which is that when a sound comes in, obviously it's going to reach one ear before it reaches the other ear. And the brain has a map inside it of how sounds will be affected by the distance they travel between the two ears. So that certainly plays a part. So if you've got a sound coming from the left, it's got to go through a certain amount of of head before it reaches the opposite ear. And that time difference, the brain can resolve that. But there is this other concept of if sounds come in from above, from a, a different vector then they will pass through a different distance through your head. They will also ricochet and echo off of the external structures of the ear, the pinna, and that means that the individual ears on each side are going to pick up slightly different echo patterns and harmonic patterns because of the sound reflections, and that too is integrated into this model that the brain has of your hearing space, and it's used to work out where the sounds come from. And this is important because if someone goes deaf in one ear, they can nonetheless make some reasonable judgment about where sounds have come from. They can still do it, and that's because each individual ear is doing its own calculations, and that's superimposed on the input from the other ear, and the two are combined to give you your overall direction of where sound comes from so thank you for the lovely question i'm sorry if i i gave it a fairly subtle a, a, a fairly short answer it was much more subtle and clever than i realized at first george good morning good morning uh, dr chris what i want to ask you is about cockroaches we stay in a block of flats we've been here for 12 years and we haven't been invaded by them but the neighbor moved in next door to us about 10 months ago, and since then we've been in, inundated with cockroaches. And I want to know, first of all, their breeding pattern. Uh, do, do they breed frequently or very frequently? And do they carry uh, viruses or germs, mm. diseases? Hi, George. Good question, George. Uh, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, we find them to be... Uh, are pesty creatures in our attitude towards them. Are they actually bad for us? Well, just like many creatures, cockroaches, they're they're just beetles and they're no more germ-ridden than other beetles that live in the same places that they do. They've just got a bit of a bad rep. Uh, Cockroaches will go wherever the food is, so it might well be that your neighbours leave things out for them to eat cockroaches will just come and scavenge and find stuff whatever's available and, and they eat it up and like any animal when the food supply is good maximum opportunity for breeding so if they're well fed and they've got places to hide and there's nothing to predate them and no one's poisoning them killing them squishing them whatever then their numbers are going to increase and the more of them there are the more you'll get because they'll breed more so no they're not any more germ ridden than any other creature that lives where cockroaches lives cockroaches live in dark corners they don't really like the light they live in dark places people often associate them with germs because they can crawl up through drains and sewers and things but then so can many different animals they're not going to give you anything nasty that other things that come into your house frequently won't um the best way to to stop them is to take away their food source and take away places for them to hide and then they they won't come. Andres, good morning. Hi, good good morning. You're speaking to Andres. Uh, I just have a question. I um, I wear hearing aids in both my ears, um, and obviously it's those types that um, you have a little thing that you put behind your ear. And I know that I am notoriously very, very bad at um, uh, 
trying to figure out if the sound is coming from above, below, behind me, in front of me, and I always feel a bit disoriented. I'm just wondering how, um, like, the shape of the ear and the hearing aid, that I know you get some of them that are inside your ear, and then obviously the one that I have behind my ear, how that affects um, the sound. Hmm. Yeah, this is a brilliant point, and this is why I wanted to return to the ear question, because our ears are something we take for granted to such a huge extent, and especially the ability of the hearing system to focus your attention on the direction in which sound is coming. Because I suspect that the person who's just called in knows only too well that when they go to a loud place, like a pub or a restaurant or or even the theatre, it's very disorientating sometimes because the sound comes in from all directions and gets amplified and it doesn't matter if it's coming from behind you or in front of you it just gets made louder by the hearing aids because hearing aids are really not very good at the moment at discriminating the direction of sound it's getting better and what people are now doing is inventing devices that can look at the source of a sound or pinpoint the source of a sound and amplify more selectively sounds coming from where they're coming from and reject sounds which are coming from elsewhere now this is the clever thing the the ear does for you all the time without you realizing the shape of the out, outer part of the ear helps to do that and then there's a lot of neurological processing that also helps to do that built in uh, connections from the visual system help to to drive that amplification process. But people are working on this directional hearing problem and trying to make hearing aids which will be much better at rejecting off-axis sound and focusing your attention and and what they amplify on what you're looking at. So that's coming, but at the moment you are in very good company because lots of people have the same problem to the point where some people with hearing aids will just turn them off in noisy environments because all they get is a barrage of, of, of very disorientating, uh, amplified, loud sounds that, that are not actually helpful. David, good morning. Yes, morning to you. Morning. Go ahead, uh, sir. Can you hear me? OK, but my question is, we're told by that uh, the universe is expanding, but not just expanding, expanding at a, an accelerated rate. So my question is, which is, uh, you know, if it's a big, if the Big Bang theory is correct, then the universe expansion should be slowing down. If the universe is expanding, what is it expanding into, and is it being pushed, uh, the acceleration, or is it being pulled? That's my question. Hi, David. All very good questions, very important questions, and questions that we actually have nothing more than theories at the moment to answer or to to provide some kind of explanation for. When the universe began as the Big Bang about 13.8 billion years ago, it expanded very rapidly from a point source. So there was something with a huge amount of energy and it quite quickly expanded to make the universe turning energy into mass via the equation E equals mc squared. It slowed down a bit, but then as it ages and grows, it appears to be accelerating again so that as the universe grows, it grows at a faster and faster rate. The capacity or the uh, entity that physicists have invoked to explain this is dark energy and dark energy is saying well we know that that there's gravity in the universe and so all things being equal you would have a net force to collapse the universe so the fact that it's growing argues that there is some kind of counterbalance to gravity which is pushing things apart this must be this dark energy but the bizarre thing is that as the universe gets bigger for it to get bigger and grow faster at a faster rate it must be making more of this dark energy or extracting more energy from somewhere to, to power that. And actually, we don't know at the moment what that process is. And that's why physicists have put the word dark in front of it, because they tend to put the word dark at the moment in front of things where we don't actually know what they are. So there's dark matter, which is gravitationally active, and there's some kind of particle, probably, which causes the the uh, gravitation effect of dark matter but we don't know what it is it won't interact with things so we can't measure it very easily and then the opposite is dark energy pushing things away again we don't know what this 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 funny component is so we put the word dark in front of it, it makes it sound mysterious and gets you grant money the effects of sibling aggression can be more significant than we once thought. 100 electrodes to link my nervous system with a computer and then onto the internet. The Naked Neuroscience podcast explores the workings of the brain and the nervous system in our bodies and beyond. That sticks and stones may break your bones, but words and neglect might hurt your brain. So you've got the little brain slice in the recording chamber. Um, and From unravelling Alzheimer's disease to digging into dreams, join me, 
Katie Haler each month as we make connections with scientists around the world and spark up conversations on the latest neuroscience news. You can listen and download for free at nakedscientist.com forward slash neuroscience or subscribe to Naked Neuroscience wherever you get your podcasts. Seven o two and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. Azar, good morning. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. What is your question? Um, my question is: um, Men normally uh, um, like urinate in like a single stream, but after they ejaculate, sometimes it comes out in many streams. Why is that so? Hi there. Well, this is this is just an anatomical question as much as a functional one. Now, when you when you actually do a wee, your bladder is a big muscular bag, and during the day it fills at the rate of about one milliliter every minute with urine from your kidneys. And once the bag has got to the point where it can't relax anymore because it undergoes something called receptive relaxation, the muscles just continuously relax to make the bag bigger, then it will fill and fill and fill until the tension in the wall of the bladder gets to a point where it then triggers a reflex through your spinal cord that says, right, now I want the bladder to contract. So the smooth muscle, which is in the wall of the bladder, all gets turned on all at once and it constricts the bladder volume down and because fluids are incompressible this produces a force out and you wee until the bladder goes down to its resting uh, pretty much empty state if you've got a healthy bladder you wee to the point where the bladder is emptied now when a person ejaculates this is not a smooth continuous contraction in the same way as a, like a balloon going down which is what's happening when the bladder's emptying an ejaculation is actually a series of peristaltic rhythmic pulses where actually you get waves of sh of smooth muscle contraction in what are called the vas deferens these are the thin muscular tubes that go from the testes up to inside the male body and then unite with the urethra where the prostate gland is and because you get these waves of contraction you get squirts and spurts rather than a smooth stream thanks so much for your question jess good morning Hello, Jess. Morning, Eusebius and Dr. Chris. I have a question about rainwater. In a discussion with a farmer recently, he said that rainwater was far better for crops than having to irrigate because it has more solvents in it. And I wondered whether you feel this is true. Yeah, this is a really important point, and it's important for several reasons, and um, very important, especially in places like Cape Town, which is uh, suffering water problems. Now, people say, well, look, we can irrigate the ground, we just take some water out of a river, or we can do a bit of desal or something, and then we'll chuck the water on the ground, and this will water the plants. The problem is that when rainwater comes down out of the sky, it's, it's got some stuff dissolved in it like some uh, carbon dioxide and some sulfur dioxide that makes it a little bit acidic and a little bit of uh, ox some of the oxides of nitrogen so there's some nitrates in there as well but it, it's pretty much to all intents and purposes pure water when it hits the ground it dissolves a small amount of salt from the ground and from the from the mountains and the hillsides that it hits it then runs into rivers that means that the rivers are still almost pure water but they have a little tiny bit of salt in them we divert that river water onto the ground and onto the land and the water soaks in but it leaves the salt behind or the plants take up the water and the salt and the water evaporates from the plants but the salt doesn't evaporate. Those plants then die, land on the ground, we plough them in, we rinse and repeat and we do this for hundreds of years and slowly the salt burden in that patch of ground goes up and up and up. So there's more salt there than there was to start with. Contrast this with just natural rainfall which is bringing down tiny amounts of material it's not net increasing the amount of salt on that patch of land so relentless irrigation will increase the salt burden in the land and that will have an impact on the ability of plants to grow in the long term and so people are very concerned about this because with climate change if we see a, a paucity of rainfall in an area and we are forced to resort increasingly to irrigation then we're going to be poisoning progressively more land over more time by increasing the salt burden in that land. And that's why scientists are looking at things like how we can genetically adapt, um, breed or use plants which are much better adapted to growing on salt-contaminated soil with, the, with this in mind in the future. Christopher, good morning. Welcome to the show. Hi. 
Hi, good morning. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask, um, what is the difference between micro and macro evolution, and what is the strongest scientific evidence for each of them? Hi, Christopher. I thought you were inviting me to the programme for a minute there, Eusebius. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, welcome, Christopher. Good name that, isn't it? Now, the difference that, that we're talking about here, with, with macro evolution, this is when you take a big step back and you look at planet Earth and you say, well, four and a half billion years ago, there was nothing there. And then about four billion years ago, we start to see evidence of microscopic life. And then by about 600 million years ago, we've now got to the point where we've got big stuff appearing. And by uh, now, we've got these enormous organisms uh, down to very tiny microscopic organisms. So you've got macroevolution, you've got things turning from the simplest things over time to the biggest things, and actually they're all related. One thing, one evolutionary step has helped another to develop. And, and we know that's happened because if we look at the genetic code which is running in a human, it's the same genetic code, it's the same software, if you like, that's running in a jellyfish, that's running in a bacterium. And we know that's true because we can take a gene from a bacterium and put it into a human and vice versa, and and the DNA machinery understands that genetic code. Now, the only explanation for that, because it's so unlikely that all these things would have evolved independently, is that bacteria have specialised and evolved over evolutionary time and they have turned into, ultimately, us. Now, it's not as simple as a bacterium turns into us. It's that there's a, a slow accrual and accumulation of changes and adaptations that enable more and more complexity to arise out of a system. Now, microevolution, on the other hand, we'll, we'll stick with bacteria because this is a neat example of this happening. If I take a swab from my mouth and I, I can see millions of microbes in there, if I grow those microbes in, say, a very high salt environment or I increase the temperature and I stress them, I'll kill off the vast majority of them, but some will survive. If I then carry on culturing the ones that survived, their progeny will be much better in future at surviving a thermal challenge or a high salt environment or other poisons because those ones by chance happen to have some kind of evolutionary or genetic adaptation that meant that they were better endowed to cope with that stress. And so as a result, quite quickly, you'll get a community of those microbes which are really good at existing in a certain environment. And that's microevolution, and it's why we have the problem of antibiotic resistance now, where we've been using a lot of antibiotics in people. We select for bacteria that naturally have an advantage over their colleagues because they can fend off that antibiotic. They grow better, and they become the bulk of the population going forward. So they have evolved at a microscopic level. We've got some questions that have come through our WhatsApp line, Chris. Let's have a listen to one of them. Hi, Chris. I'm just wanting to find out, um, is maths innately kind of tied into the universe or is it a framework that we're imposing on the universe? Because I know, you know, we've got five fingers, uh, I mean, ten fingers and toes, so we work with ten, the number ten. But I'm just wondering, with that in mind, are we imposing a framework onto the universe or is, is math something that we discovered innate in the universe? The philosophy of maths, Chris, over yeah, to inter you. Interesting one, this, isn't it? Well, the answer is that we, we use numbers that are convenient for us, and, and this is quite right. We've got um, 10 digits on you know on our hands, on our arms. We've got another 10 on our feet, so we tend to, to yeah. like things that involve <laughs> tens. But anyone who's got yeah. a watch, an analogue watch, knows full well that, that base 60 is used as well. So it's 60 seconds, 60 minutes, and then 24 yes. hours in a day. So we don't have to use rigid sets of numbers that involve tens. And, in fact, other ancient cultures used a very different set of, of numberings and and how they did maths. But what maths does enable us to do is to see relationships between things and account for those relationships and make predictions. So um, I think maths is a framework that we've invented as humans for, for our benefit, but the relationships still exist regardless. It's a bit like saying, if we weren't here to, to measure it, would there be time in the universe? And the answer is yes, there almost certainly is time because it appears that the universe only moves in one direction, getting getting bigger with a more spread out uh, uh, distribution of energy and so on. So I think maths is a, a framework that we use to understand these relationships and, and, it, and th those relationships will exist. We just have to invent the maths that can describe them. Paul, good morning. Hi, yes, Hi, Dr. Chris. Um, okay, I need to know if it's a genetic thing, a DNA thing, a chromosome thing, or a big macho thing that <laughs> men seem to <laughs> men seem to be able to handle hotter food like cheese and curries than women, or they actually 
enjoy it more than women do. <laughs> I've just noticed this in general. And um, uh, <laughs> I'd like to know what you think, uh, Doctor. <laughs> Thanks for that question, um, Paul. You know, Chris, there's a there's a there's an empirical assumption there. I wonder whether it's actually accurate. Even though, to be fair, and Paul, he he does acknowledge that he's is based on his own experience. I'd love to know in places like India, for example, whether indeed it is men who have a higher tolerance. Yeah, well, I love hot curry. Um, I think I think though that a lot of us who go around eating these really hot curries are fooling ourselves that we're really enjoying it because what we're really enjoying is actually the fact that we've managed to eat this thing that we previously couldn't, <laughs> and we've we've now managed to tolerate the the pain. We've tolerated on many occasions the aftermath, so we've psychologically prepared ourselves for what's going to happen the next day, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes, uh, I have yes. I've been out to dinner with a number of women who've eaten as much chili as I have, and I eat very hot hot food. So I don't think there's a physiological reason. I think the main reason is is a common sense reason, reason that us blokes do like to prove ourselves, and it, and it is a macho element to this. I don't think there's any fundamental reason why a person would have a higher threshold effect for chilli just based on sex alone. The reason for this is the spicy ingredient in chilli is a chemical called capsaicin, and capsaicin is made by chilli peppers. It's a molecule which binds to a certain receptor or chemical docking station which is expressed on tiny nerve fibres called C fibres. And those C fibres, C for capsaicin effectively, when they see this molecule, it triggers the fibre to send a barrage of nerve impulses into the nervous system. Those nerve impulses normally signal pain or temperature. So when you put the chilli in your mouth, the reason you think it's hot, and we all use the word hot to describe a curry, is because you are activating the same pathways that normally, if you were to put, a, say, a hot spoon or a hot fork in your mouth and say, oh, that's, that's hot metal, you're activating the yeah. same nerve fibres. But instead of doing it thermally, you're doing it chemically and fooling the nerves into thinking they're being heated up. There's no difference, really, in the density of those, in the response of those to capsaicin in, in men or women. But the more curry that's really hot that you eat, the greater your tolerance. So it's quite possible that a person who's been exposed to a lot of curry is going to have pruned back some of these C fibres a bit and their response to those capsaicin signals and therefore they won't experience the same burning as someone who hasn't had that degree of training, let's call it, in the past. So there will be a difference between individuals but that's probably based on a little bit of inter-individual difference and a lot of past experience and it's probably a macho thing in us blokes that we, you know, we feel we have to prove something. <laughs> We probably also over report. <laughs> Cizwe, good morning to you. Good morning good to you. Evening, Welcome to you. the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, what I'd like to know is um, my, my, my partner is 18 months pregnant and uh, we previously lost our baby at eight months, right? Um, so she went for blood tests last week and it was discovered that one, of, uh, one out of the the hundred of her chromosomes has signs of um, Down syndrome. Uh, we were then informed that we have to go for a panorama test, which includes 13, 21, 18 Y and X chromosomes. So I'd like to know what are the chances that the baby actually has Down syndrome based on this and the risk involved with the test. Um, is it related to amniocentesis, uh, which from what I read uh, poses a risk to both her and the baby? Hmm. It sounds to me, did you say that she's eight months pregnant? 18. 18 weeks. 18 months. No, oh, I don't. Sorry, I don't weeks. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> I, I think, um, I, I think buffaloes have a two year. Is it, but elephants have a two year gestation. No, I, don't, I hope you're not married to an elephant. No, I'm being very impolite about your partner. Sorry about that. I'm sure she's, I'm sure she's not at all. Um, right, 18 weeks. This is a sort of standard time for people to start you, having, um, having extra scans distress. and Go things. Ahead, um, 18 weeks is the time at which, um, 18 to 20 weeks is the time at which we tend to do uh, the second scan because you do a dating scan mm. at about 10 weeks and this, this confirms when we think conception occurred which gives us an ideal due date so we can then track how fast the baby's growing. You can track whether growth is against milestones. The babies at that stage are too small to see much so we call people back at 20 weeks or so have a look at them and then you can see all the major bits and pieces because the baby is pretty fully developed by then it just needs to get bigger and so you can see all the organ systems and you can check that everything looks okay and if nothing looks amiss and everything's growing correctly then doctors normally reassure mums and say it's all fine unless you have a reason for concern we'll just keep monitoring that you're growing okay and following all the milestones if anything's spotted that's amiss or there's a past history that something might have gone wrong sometimes we pay a bit more attention now there's a number of ways to look at at these sorts of situations in in one of them is that you can 
uh, a bit earlier than 18 weeks you'd normally do this, you can go in with a needle and take a sample of the placenta. This is called chorionic villus sampling. There's another approach, which is where you go in with a similarly long needle, but you go into the bag of fluid around the baby and you take some amniotic fluid. This is called amniocentesis. With both of these tests, what you're doing is going for baby cells, the fetal cells, which are naturally there. And you can then put them under a microscope and count the chromosomes, and or you can read the DNA sequence, depending upon what you're looking for. And this gives you an idea as to whether or not there's a problem. Now, those sorts of tests do carry a risk to the baby if you do an amniocentesis or a chorionic villus sample because you are sticking something into where the baby is or into the structures it's making. Those risks are very small. They're less than 1%, but they're not zero. And in a good centre, it'll be way less than 1%, but it's still not zero. So some people would prefer not to do that. And the new thing that people are doing now is to take a blood sample from the mum because there's very clever algorithms that can sort out what DNA in mum's blood has come from mum and what DNA is there from the baby because we can actually now count the chromosomes from the baby up in the mum's blood because when a mother is pregnant some of the baby cells fall over into her circulation and spill out some of their DNA and you can see that and that's a totally harm, harmless non-invasive test uh, won't place any risk on the baby but that can then be used all these tests can be used to give um, a, a likelihood of down syndrome um, it's not until you've actually got some fetal tissue that you can actually prove that you've got one of these conditions but those those are the options i can't possibly comment based on what you told me what the risk is but the thing is in a young healthy person there's there's always a risk but it's and it's always greater than zero but you can't say because it's happened once before it's definitely going to happen again you should go and have the proper tests and find out because these sorts of genetic things are not something that we should just give a flippant answer on the radio to hmm. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, it's been a, a, another stunning segment of The Naked Scientist. We'll do it again next week. Thank you. Thanks very much. See you soon, Eusebius. Bye, everybody.